Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see uh, so many of you here uh, on an early Saturday morning. Uh, my name is uh, Rob Hodge. I am a supervisory patent examiner here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, and I am actually one of the supervisors in our uh, Pro Se Pilot Art Unit. Um, the other supervisor is actually sitting in the back. <clears throat> um, but today I have a, a nice panel here to uh, uh, talk about uh, some of the people who have been able to utilize uh, some of the uh, pro bono services and pro se services as well. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panel members is um, stuck in transit at the moment, uh, basically uh, experiencing the uh, delays of, of working on our metro system. Um, but I would like to go ahead and uh, first introduce um, Ruth. Um, Ruth is an entrepreneur and inventor of the hybrid bedsheet collection. Now, one thing I'd also like to highlight is her journey actually started right here at InventionCon in 2017. So at that convention, she actually uh, met one of the speakers, and that speaker invited her to a competition in New York City. And at that competition, she was actually awarded first place for her innovative bedsheets. Um, and then two weeks after she received that award, uh, she received an investment of $25,000 from enthusiasts who believed in her invention. Um, Ruth actually took advantage of the uh, pro bono services through the USPTO Law School Clinic um, and also received assistance from the Pro Se Assistance Program. Uh, so I will hand it over to Ruth to talk about her journey um, through the intellectual property and. Uh, all that stuff. Good morning. Um, I want to start by saying uh, a phrase that was Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I said, uh, someone said to me, from mate to inventor. Um, my background. Uh, very briefly, I cleaned houses for about 24 years, and I, in doing that job on a daily basis, I encountered the difficulties of making bets. Um, so I got tired of waiting for um, someone to create a better set of bed sheets because I would do three to seven beds per day. So. Um, doing this from Monday to Sunday, I just uh, was fed up with, with all the issues that that brought to my daily life. So uh, one morning my husband woke up and he was upset because the, the bed sheet kept coming off and so uh, from the mattress. And so I decided to just do something about that. Um, that was the beginning of this journey. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I needed to create that solution. And I thought, if I have that problem, I'm pretty sure a lot of people have the same problem. I, I thought, I, I imagine how the ladies that work in, in the hotel industry or the men that do that job uh, will struggle with the same issue. So um, I created the prototype. My husband noticed a few weeks after that the bed sheet wasn't snapping off uh, from the mattress. And so he, he said, he looked at it and he said, uh, where did you get this from? And I said, um, I created it. And so he said, we need to do something about this. And I said, we? Oh, now we <laughs> speak French? And so... But, you know, actually I was glad that he noticed because we were using that prototype and I was just, you know, glad that the bed sheet wasn't coming up from the mattress. So anyway, he started doing some uh, Google search and that's how he came up uh, uh, with the Invention Con 2017 across the, the, the um, advertisement for that. And so he um, now... I need to mention that we just had came out, out of uh, being homeless. 
Um, unfortunately, I suffered a car accident and I, um, uh, my husband was taking care of me. I couldn't move and so uh, he ended up losing his job. So we exhausted our savings and we ended up being homeless. That was a few years ago. And so uh, when uh, we got moving to, into our new place, that's when this whole thing started, the bed sheet. And so um, we didn't have the money to come to the conference because we saw that it was all the way over here. I'm from San Diego, California. So we started talking about doing something because it was important to us that I, I had to have a protection on my idea, on my invention. I didn't take it that serious at the moment, but my husband saw the potential. So anyway, we ended up coming to the Invention Con 2017. Um, I have to say that we slept in our rental car but we were here. That's what it mattered to us. When we were here, those two days were, to both of us, it was unbelievable. It was amazing. I thought that to have a patent, to file for a patent, it was going to be impossible. My background was cleaning houses. I mean, I had no idea what it, it I mean, I thought I wasn't going to be capable of uh, getting that type of protection on my idea. Financially, intellectually, it was challenging. But when I came to the conference, it was just uh, sitting there and listening to the experts and guiding, uh, guiding us how to uh, overcome those obstacles. It was just to me like a dream come true. I thought, this can be done. We, we can do it. So I thought, um, my husband and I, we were taking notes, and after uh, people speaking here, I will approach them. I will ask them, what do I need to do? How can I do this? Anyway, um, second year came, uh, 2018, and I knew there was no way I was, I was going to miss InventionCon 2018. I was still struggling financially, so I asked uh, one of my children to let me borrow the money. So she used her credit card and she purchased the airplane ticket uh, for me to be able to come here. I still had to sleep on the rental car, and, um, but it was great. I didn't care. To me, all of this was well worth it. I don't see it as a sacrifice. I see it as an investment. So it, it was just uh, unbelievable. I can assure you, if you're sitting there, um, I'm there, I, I can tell you it can be done. I learned how to utilize the uh, pro bono services through the law clinics. I went back to San Diego immediately apply for the pro bono services at the Thomas Jefferson School of Law, and sure enough, they called me. They saw my idea, they, they liked it, and they took me in. And I mean, I can share so much about all the resources that are there. I started using the SBDC programs to create my business plan, which I had no clue whatsoever what was that about. At this point, I have three different business plans, and um, I have more knowledge that I could ever believe I could store in my brain. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, we'll, we'll wait for questions uh, for the end. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Steele, who is the founder and owner of Motor Breeze LLC. Um, he actually does have an issued U.S. patent. Uh, it's 8,978,827, which probably doesn't mean much to you, but the title is actually a wind-driven lubricator for motorcycle drivetrain. Um, he's also uh, has some uh, issued foreign uh, patents, and he does have a U.S. trademark. Um, so Michael Steele uh, has a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering from North Carolina State University. Um, and he has more than 30 years of experience in the defense industry, uh, primarily with the U.S. Navy, 
and holds, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, U.S. and international patents. Um, he successfully navigated the patent process as a pro se inventor here in the United States, Canada, and Australia. So now I'll hand it over to him to talk about his journey. Thank you, Robert. I'm not sure. That's not a... Oh, there's a tiny switch on the tub. There you go. That's an engineer for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Mike Steele. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a mechanical engineer by degree. Um, I worked with the Navy. I worked on nuclear submarines as a test engineer for about 17 years. Uh, I've worked on um, IT projects with um, uh, some of the new classes of destroyers and things like that. But I'm kind of your prototypical inventor. Um, I always thought it'd be cool to invent something. You know, throughout my career, I'm thinking, man, it'd be you know, as an engineer, that's what you want to do is invent something. But every time I'd come up with an idea. You know, I'd Google it, and it was invented like 40 years ago. So I'm sure you guys have run across that too. But um, so um, I was working in my garage on my motorcycle, and one of the things I, I bought a motorcycle. I was having a midlife crisis, so I bought a motorcycle. And uh, one of the things that that I hated doing, you had to clean and lubricate the chain every three to 500 miles. So I, I kind of equated that to having to change your oil every three to 500 miles. Because you really got you, you got greasy, and you know, the, uh, my motorcycle weighed 450 pounds. It's not like when you're a kid you can flip your bike over on the handlebars and seat and squirt some WD-40 on it. So you had to either inch it forward a couple inches, you know, do a little cleaning, inch inch it forward a little bit more, or get the rear wheel off the ground somehow so you could do it. So it's kind of a, a real operation. So I started tinkering around with chain oilers. There were some on the market that were very complex. And very expensive so I started tinkering around in my garage just making them out of well, well actually the the first prototype I made because I just wanted to prove my, to myself that it well let, let me back up I was making chain oilers out of like PVC pipe using a reservoir and having like a little valve you could turn it off and on um, things like that but they were ones that if you if you left it on it was going to leave a big puddle of oil on the floor if you if you got, forgot to turn it off so one thing kept eating at me. I kept thinking, why couldn't you use wind power? You know, because not not because you know it's efficient or anything, but because the wind is there when you're riding and it's gone when you stop. So if it was wind powered, it would be also automatic. So um, I kept yeah. You know, I thought about it and I'm like, no, nah, that's not going to work. That wouldn't work. And then it just kept eating at me. It's like I put it on the back shelf of my brain and. Uh, and so one day I started thinking, I'm like, well, what if you just pointed a tube into the wind? You know, how much pressure would that generate? So being a good engineer that had been out of school for 25 years or so, um, I said, uh, let me Google it. So I Googled and found the formula for dynamic pressure and plugged, plugged numbers in. It was like, okay, well, this seems like it would be enough pressure to work. So um, actually the first prototype was one of these little, a little water bottle like this. And what I did is put a one tube in, one tube out. One tube ran up to the front of the motorcycle to catch the wind, and the other tube I just ran to nowhere because it was just water. I got on my bike and rode for about five miles and, and got off, took the seat off, and all the water had gone out of the bottle. So that, that was kind of what proved the concept that it would work. So um, I started tinkering around and, and convinced myself that it was going to work. So I went and filed a... Um, I filed a uh, well, first of all, I didn't know anything about patents, just like Ruth was saying, you know, it's kind of a mystery. I knew what patents were. So went to the PTO website, you know, the first thing you run into is, you know, kind of avoid, avoid invention scams and things like that. But then there was a list of lawyers. So I, I, called, a, I called one of the lawyers off the list that was, was, um, did mechanical inventions and said, you know, told him what, you know, that, that I had this invention I thought I could patent. Well, I kind of got, like a lot of you guys probably get, you get sticker shock, you know, when you first talk to a lawyer. And he, he kind of told me, said, you know, uh, you, you need to think about your business plan if you can afford to spend $20,000 over the next five years. And I was like, whoa, $20,000. I had, both of my sons were in middle school, high school, so they were not far away from college. And I said, you know, if I... If some somehow can squeeze out twenty thousand dollars to get a patent, that'll be it. That'll be all I have. It's a patent hanging on the wall. I'll never be able to go any further. So I ended up um, 
Well, what this lawyer told me, he said, go read, I want, before we talk any further, I want you to go read this book called Patent It Yourself. And you guys have probably heard of it before. And I'm not saying it's the best patent book out there, but I read the book and I called him back. I said, well, I've definitely decided I want to get a patent, but um, you know, 20, were you serious about $20,000? Because this invention is really simple. He goes, because he didn't even know what it was at this point. And he said, no, nah, let's plan on spending that because it's a lot of back, sometimes there's a lot of back and forth with the patent office. So, um, so I went home, talked to my wife, Maureen, who's in the back there. Um, and uh, she said, uh, she didn't know anything about this up till now. And I told her I had this invention that I thought I could patent, but this lawyer told me it was gonna be $20,000. And she didn't flinch. I mean, her head didn't start spinning around and, and <laughs> spit up pea soup or anything like that. But, uh, um, so I knew that she would be on board with it if I had if I had to do it, but I, but I knew that I couldn't do it financially with my where my kids were, so so to make a long story short, I ended up writing my own U.S. patent, um, filed uh, a PCT about a, a year later. You have to file within a year if you want international protection. So I filed a PCT about a year later, and I'm telling you, my my finger was on that mouse on the 364th day because that one was kind of expensive. It was. I think the U.S. patent was like $500 to file at the time, and the PCT was going to be 45. It was 4,500, which was a pretty good chunk. So I, my finger was on that mouse up till like 11 o'clock at night you know, on the 364th day. But I went ahead and filed it, and subsequently ended up filing in Canada, um, Canada, Australia, and then Europe. And I've got now have eight issued patents. Um, U.S., Canada, Australia, um, U.K., France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. And the reason I went to those countries was because that's where most of the motorcycles in the world are, chain-driven motorcycles. So this is kind of uh, just if you, if you want to see what the invention, what the actual product looks like, it's a little reservoir of oil that goes under the seat of your motorcycle, and, and, uh, and it's got another... Um, small tube that this this tube runs up and just mounts like on the side of the headlight of the motorcycle and that that pressure when it builds up comes into this side and it pressurizes this little glass bowl or this little plastic bowl here that pushes oil up through the, the center through a flow restrictor then goes out into a um, little uh, felt pad that runs underneath the chain so I'm just showing you this. I'm not here trying to sell these or anything like that, but I'm just showing you that because it's such a simple, it's such a simple idea, such a simple invention. I knew I had to have patent protection because this would be very easy to, to knock off. Um, so, um, so I've actually um, sold these in over 40 countries, um, including the, in, in, mo mo mainly in the U.S., but I've actually sold them in about 40 countries. So. The, the, the story, at least that today, has a happy ending of, of, I was able to, my kids got to go to college. The last one just graduated this year from um, Towson University. Um, was able to get the patent, patent done. I've got international pre patent protection. And uh, so, all's well that ends well, I guess. It's, well, it wasn't easy, but it's, uh, it's, it, it, was, it was an interesting journey. Okay, well, while we're waiting for our other panelists uh, to arrive, um, I would actually uh, like to start to see if there's any questions uh, in the audience, and please wait for um, somebody to come around uh, with a microphone. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and um, start up wi uh, with a question for both of you. Um, what was the biggest challenge in getting your patent or trademark? For me, uh, the first thing was uh, the uh, language barrier. Uh, even though my husband is an American, my English was way limited <laughs> than what it is now. Uh, so I thought that I was going to be reading all these big words that I actually have, uh, now I know, I've been working on pronunciation and all that, like embodiments. <laughs> so, um, uh, that was my first challenge, but that was just here. So, I had to start thinking on changing my mindset. I had to start thinking that I'm capable, that I can do it, that I was going to be able to nail this because I uh, 
have a future and I see myself uh, living hopefully uh, 80, 90, 100, and how am I I'm gonna be able to, to move forward or how am I gonna be able to live? So I had to make sure that my uh, retirement plan is, is good, right? But I didn't have any money, so I thought if I continue thinking that I can't do it, uh, I'm not gonna make it. So my first challenge was to get rid of that mentality. So you can do it, and I would think to myself, si se puede. So yes, you can. So I started studying just um, every single day. Uh, till this day, I still spend just four or five hours uh, reading, making sure I know about the field that I'm going to, uh, improving my English, uh, going out there, learning about my business, and so some of those challenges I have been able to overcome. Okay, thank you. So, so the first challenge for me with getting a patent was keeping my mouth shut because <laughs> you, know, you, you, want to, you want to go out and tell everybody that's what you're doing because you're kind of excited about it, but um, you know you really can't. At the, I think at the time I filed, it was, it was first to invent, but now, it's, now with it being first to file, it's even more important that you, you kind of keep it quiet. Um, matter of fact, I, when I went home and talked to my, when I was talking to my wife, that initial conversation, I said, now if I tell you what this invention is, you can't, you can't tell anybody. You can't tell your sister, my mother, you can't tell anybody. And when I said, you can't put it on Facebook, that's when she said, don't tell me. So I, I literally didn't tell her until after I'd filed the patent. <laughs> So, uh, um, and then the, the second challenge was time because I wrote my own patent and I was working full time, you know, you got to find time to do it. So it was, um, it probably took me, I think I talked to the lawyer in August when he told me to read patent it yourself. So I read the book all the way through um, and then I called him back and he said, you know, and I told you what that conversation was like. And so once I decided to do it myself, I'd go read every chapter. Before I was getting ready to write that section of the patent, I'd go reread that chapter. And, and the book had checklists in it where you could, um, but still took me probably three and a half months. I think I, that, that all happened in August, and I think December 15th was when I filed the patent. So it took me about three and a half months. I'd, I'd write a couple hours a night just, you know, and then and check it over and stuff. And then I'd get, I might get sick of it for a couple of days and go back and write some more and stuff. And, and then there was probably two or three weeks at the end where I was like, ah, oh, I, I know I've messed something up. I've, I've missed a word here in the claims or something that, that it's going to cause me to lose all my patent protection. So, so yeah, time was a, a big factor. Later on, money got to be a, a little bit of a factor. Luckily, I was already selling the product, so it wasn't um, as big of a strain. But um, when you get into the international side, like I said, the PCT was expensive. Australia and Canada weren't too bad, um, but when you get to Europe, it's expensive. And part of the thing I was filing in the European Patent Office, which covers a lot of countries, so it's going to be more expensive. Um, but that was like, you know, it was 4,500 for the PCT. Then when I filed in Europe, the fees were 3,300, I think, to file. And in Europe, you can't, well, you can't um, represent yourself before the Patent Office. You have to have a patent attorney in Europe. So I had to. I had to get a patent attorney over there to, to file my patents for me. So you know, they every time they do something, they're going to they're going to tack on a little bit to it. So um, then I guess you know during the patent prosecution part, first of all, it goes into a black hole for like th two years. You know, so you file your patent and you're sitting there thinking, are they just sitting there laughing at it? And that's why it's <laughs> taking so long. <laughs> so so um, it, it it took about two years, and and so the, just the waiting part of it is kind of hard. You, you're thinking, you know. And I'm, I'm in the, I'm you know, starting to make, you know, starting to make these and sell them. Am I gonna, is the patent gonna get shot down or something like that? Um, and then when the, when, the, when you finally do get the first office action, I mean, it's like 10 or 15 pages of, of legalese, and and you're, and, and it's kind of scary at first. You know, they're like you violated United States code this, and I'm looking to see if the police are outside. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, like my patent application. Um, the only real problem they had with it is that I had, uh, there's, in, there's depend, independent claims, which are the important ones, and there's dependent claims. And I had a, a, a dependent claim that basically said that you could, 
in, in layman's terms, you, that you could tell the level of oil of liquid in the in this part without taking it apart. And um, so anything you have in your claims, you have to have backed up in the specification. So what the the issue was, he said that I didn't have that in the specification. So it was actually really good. I called the patent attorney, I mean the patent um, examiner. They put the patent examiner's name and phone number in there. You can call them. I called the patent examiner, thanked him for his you know, thorough examination of my application and said, uh, um, yeah, I think I have what your, the issue was covered, but I'd like to show you where. So I showed him in the specification. I basically said that this part was made out of a translucent plastic material. And he said, okay, I can kind of see that. Um, so um, probably what you need to do is just clarify that in the specification. So I basically added um, to the end of that sentence, I put, you know, to facilitate visual detection of the liquid level. And he said, if you do that, he goes, I think we can get it through. So about, I think that was in December of 2014. So it's about two years after I filed it. And, and then, uh, and I think by March, I had the patent hanging on my wall in my family room. So. Yes. Okay. Mike, over here. Um, I know you said you hold some international patent protection as well. Congratulations. Um, how do you police those? Especially in a place like Europe where going from Germany to France is like going from here to, you know, D.C. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a good question because, e I mean, even if it's, even if the patent were infringed in the U.S., you, you really have to kind of think about, you know, how much is it going to cost to, to enforce it? And I'm sure in, you know, doing it from the U.S. and Europe, it's probably going to be, um, I, I personally, I kind of look at the patent as a deterrent, you know, that, um, that um, people are going to think twice before they, before they knock it off. But um, luckily, I haven't, I haven't had to do that yet. Um, and, you know, this, um, you know, there's different ways you can go with, when you get, take a product to market, you can, uh, you can license it, which is a good, good way to do it. But this, I thought that this, you know, licensing, they you normally are going to want something that every man, woman, and child in the U.S., in the, in the world needs, where this is a very narrow, this is kind of a narrow uh, field. So um, I think that, that kind of limits the, the number of people that, that would try to knock it off. But it, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it, it, it'd be very hard to police. But to answer your question, how do I police it? Just looking online to see, <coughs> see if it's anywhere. I sell, I, I sell these on Amazon. Uh, in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, um, all the European and Amazon in Europe, and Amazon in Australia, and uh, I haven't, I haven't. Once in a while, I run into seeing my product somewhere else, but it's, but they're buying it from me and reselling it, so I don't really care. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. Hi, uh, question to Mike. When you started, when you started with uh, filing, uh, did you always was having consultation with uh, uh, lawyers? No, uh, I only had that initial conversation with the lawyer where you know we got to the point where he kind of told me how much it was going to cost and told me to read that book. Most everything I did with writing the patent was out of that book. Patent it yourself. Yeah. Uh, this question for Ruth how about I um, so uh, I just curious uh, in 2017 how did you get here I'm sorry in two, uh, you, you mentioned uh, your journey coming here right and uh, so you you had to sleep in your rental car but how did you get here in 2017 I, was I, I flew with you, my husband. We, we, uh, we flew to okay. here, yeah. We actually make it an adventure. Uh, he's not that kind of guy. He much rather had to stay home, but he wasn't going to let me come all by myself. So he's like, well, let's just uh, make it fun. And so after here, uh, we went to visit some relatives that he has uh, nearby. And I said, well, we're going to visit your family. Let's visit my family. So we drove to North Carolina. And then we were like, what the heck? Let's just go to New York. And so we <laughs> drove to New York. So it, it was, it was a, a great experience. But um, I, I believe that when you 
don't have the means to do something, but you're determined, you won't let anything to get in the way. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad to say that this year I'm doing a lot better, but I believe that for as long as I, I can, I'll be attending this conference. It, it has helped me a lot. I'm still learning uh, just from uh, hearing all uh, the experts' advice, and you never stop learning. So um, I don't see it as a sacrifice. I always see it as an investment. Next question. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, for both uh, panelists, um, could you tell us a little bit more about like uh, prototyping um, and also manufacturing and maybe a little bit about marketing, where, where you're at or how that worked? And if you um, want to or have you licensed it outright or you sell it direct? Thanks. You want to go first? Okay. Um, so uh, prototyping, I kind of told you what the first prototype was, a little water bottle. but. After that, you know, need to get a little bit more serious. So I was putting oil in it and stuff. So um, I went. I'm trying to remember um, some of the first prototypes of the wind of the wind powered one because it has to be fairly small. You know, it can't. If it was this big, you may not develop enough wind pressure to push the oil out of it. So I think the first ones they were. I, I don't know what. I don't know how to describe them, but it's like one of those bottles you might use it in a lab that's got like a little. It's like this, and it's got a little spout coming off of it. And when you squeeze it, the water will, the water will squirt out of it. Um, I used something like that for a while. Um, and actually, this was actually my last prototype. And, and when I, after I got the patent filed, I was thinking, um, now it looked a little different than this. It was a little more crude. But um, when I got, after I got the patent filed, I said, uh, um, well, this actually looks. This actually doesn't look bad. If I put a label on it and I make the, like before, it did. It has these barb connections where you had to put the tube onto it, and I made them so they're quick disconnects. So you can just take them. You can. It makes it really easy to take it out to refill with oil. So I said, well, that will work at least for a while. And I've made some improvements to it over time. But that that's how I actually went from directly from the prototype to the to the finished product with a few with a few improvements. Um, and then as far as uh, manufacturing, one of the things I've been uh, kind of blessed with uh, and maybe lucky is that I was able to find things that, that were already, that already exist in the world, that, that I didn't have to go and get molds made for, for these things. So what, the, what this piece actually is, is actually an air filter that you would use for, air, for, air, for compressed air. So um, I can buy these. And if, and if any of you guys are looking for um, things that what might make up your product or things that are similar, uh, Google it and and switch to images. And then, so what I did I, when I was looking for something like this, I just Googled it and said um, res uh, reservoir with two ports, and just Googled it, and it might have been on the 20th page of the images. But I was like, hey, that looks about what I'm looking for. And this one happened to be on Alibaba, so it was uh, you know just. Uh, contacted somebody on Alibaba and said, "Hey, how much would it be?" Um, the, and so the people that I buy the the actual parts from, they don't really know what I'm doing with them. They they think I'm buying them for air filters, and so. Um, <laughs> and then as far as marketing, um, getting started, I didn't have a big marketing budget, but I just started. You know, you can use like eBay. I didn't put it on Amazon at first, but I put it on eBay, and and that's how I kind of got started with international sales because I had it on eBay just selling it in the US and, and all of a sudden I started getting people from Australia and places like that saying, hey, will you ship to Australia? So I was like, okay, well, there's a seems like there's a, a market uh, in other countries too. Um, but then pay-per-click like Google, Google AdWords and things like that, you can, you know, if you, I created a website to, 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 with a lot of information about the product and, and I was actually selling it there too. So um, you can use pay-per-click, you can say if somebody's searching for motorcycle chain oiler, it'll show your ad at the top of Google and stuff like that. That's a fairly cheap way to get started. For me, the prototyping started with that set of bed sheets that kept coming off the mattress. They were given to me by a client. They were almost brand new, and I knew right away why she got rid of them. So uh, I had to find out if my idea, which by the way I had had for a long time, uh, it was going to work. So what I did was that <clears throat> I, 
I drove to LA and uh, we spent the whole day uh, with my friend. Uh, she actually made a couple of mistakes because she couldn't understand what could I uh, improve on the bed sheet besides just putting a thicker elastic band at the, at the bottom. So anyway, we, we did it on, um, well, I told her how to do it. And so we tried different type of lycras because the innovation on the bed sheet consists of uh, multi-directional and stretchable edges and corners. So that's what allows the bed sheet to stretch and not to come off. Like when, you're, when you uh, go and lay down on the bed and then in the nighttime you're tossing and turning and that's when the bed sheet many times comes, comes off. Or uh, when whoever here does their bed, when you're on one side, you already successfully put the bed sheet on that side. And then you're on this side trying to, to finish making it. And then, poof, comes. Uh, that's so stressful, so upsetting, especially <laughs> when you have to do a lot of beds a day. So anyway, um, uh, we uh, did that. And as I mentioned earlier, we came back, I used a prototype, and it worked perfectly fine. So um, that worked. We tried different uh, measurements uh, to see which way it would work better. I actually had, uh, I don't know, about seven prototypes before I was happy. Because even though back then I, didn't know I was uh, an inventor or innovator. I'm always being a perfectionist. So I also created the bed sheet, that, the flat sheet, that in my opinion, I, I thought, why no one comes up with a better flat sheet that just saves you time? So um, when you work in hospitality, I, I, I also was cleaning Airbnbs, so you have to make sure that the beds look beautiful because you have people coming, uh, and the first thing they see is, uh, you know, when you go into the bedroom, you're tired from your trip, you want to go in and rest. The last thing you want to be uh, doing is stressing or, uh, you know, dealing with the bed. Uh, it's, it's relaxing to see a beautiful bed. So anyway, uh, but when you're making the beds and you make uh, seven beds per day, you wish to just put the flat sheet and get it over, over with. So anyway, the innovation on the flat sheet is I incorporated side flaps and literally takes seconds to, to put it on the bed. Uh, you just put it on and fold it on the top and it's done. It, it's ready. It, for someone with experience, uh, as me, it takes me literally 20 seconds to put it on. So I thought that that would be a great thing for the hospitality industry. So I, um, I have rejected a couple of licensing offers because they were not convenient for me. Right now, uh, we are talking with a big manufacturing company in Ohio that saw the bed sheets and they love them. They believe they have great potential and both uh, retail and uh, hospitality. And uh, well, they're gonna be manufacturing the bed sheets. Um, I wanna mention that I have also um, designed other household products like a shoe organizer, uh, jewelry organizer. And uh, I'm so blessed because this uh, manufacturing company works also with different type of um, uh, products that they can use for uh, hotel chains, uh, large hotel chains actually, they, those are their customers. So um, it's still not in the market yet, but I can confidently say, say that pretty soon we'll be having those manufactured. Yeah. Uh, now I see that you people, uh, did use existing products. Now, uh, was, did you get your patent based on the functionality of the product? What type of uh, patent did you end up getting? And uh, as far as you getting in touch, uh, Ruth getting in touch with manufacturers, how was that possible? Did this office help you through or did you do it on your own? 
Uh, no, when, when I have attended the um, conf conferences, uh, Invention Con, you have experts that come here and they, you know, they guide you through or they share information who you can contact. In my case, uh, because I contacted the pro bono services like the law clinics, uh, the SBDC, the WBC, the Women Business Center, the Small Business uh, Development Center, uh, that's how I learned uh, how to navigate uh, the programs. And once you start going, attending these uh, type of conferences or networking events or classes or workshops, you start making connections. You start meeting people. And to me, uh, I, I didn't have the means to be paying for, for a patent attorney or for business advisors or for, you know, uh, there, there is so many resources out there. All you need to do is just attend these type of conferences, go to your local uh, uh, law clinics, uh, the, the SBDC. I mean, there is so many resources, but how I got through my manufacturing company is that I, I was taken actually by the University of San Diego Innovation Program. I pitched to them my, my idea. They loved it. They took me in right away. So I have the great blessing to work with people that are expert, exper, experts in their fields. And one of them is Natalia. She's a great blessing. She actually is a business advisor uh, through the Brink at the University of San Diego. And she uh, saw the potential in, in the product, and she liked me too. So she helped me to uh, find a manufacturing company. So what we did, or mostly she, she did, I was doing that, but because of uh, the fact that uh, I, you know, I, I can communicate as well as she does. She's also a patent attorney. Um, she was the one making the contact. So from 100 manufacturing companies that she contacted, we went down to 20, then to 10, and then to five across the country. So I sent my prototypes. Uh, obviously, I have NDAs, non-disclosure agreements uh, sent to them. And then I send the prototypes. And then we end up choosing the one that uh, we felt it was the right fit for us. And that's how I came um, to find that uh, manufacturing company. But it's always uh, keeping in mind that you have to put yourself out there. You have to take advantage of all these resources. Um, in, in my case, um, I haven't spent much money in, in getting uh, most of my, uh, what it takes to protect my idea. Obviously, I, I spend money on um, legal services because you have to pay for uh, fees, um, but mostly n no marketing. I have one of the best uh, marketing experts in the country uh, working pro bono for me, and that's, again, because I got the services through the uh, through the SBDC and through the University of San Diego, the Brink program. Hi. Uh, oh. Utility. It's a utility button. Same here, utility. Um, hi, I, I found both your stories very inspiring, so thank you. Um, the question I have is, say someone comes up with a, a patent, it's a, the patent's been issued, is internationally protected. How do you protect yourself against like a gigantic corporation that has an army of lawyers that's doesn't care about the patents, you just go ahead and inviolate it anyway. So you have to uh, lawyer up or whatever. And then um, what if they claim that you're destroying their product by your patent is, your, your product is superior to theirs and so you're ru ruining their market so they sue you for that. What, what kind of protections are there for that sort of eventuality? So uh, as far as the um 
somebody in a big company infringing on your patent, that's, cer that's certainly a problem. And I can't really, I've been lucky enough it hasn't happened, and I'm not sure what I would do if it did, because, you know, if, it's, if I've got to go spend a quarter million dollars on lawyer fees, you know, uh, why, why bother really? Because, you know, I'd rather just keep trying to sell the product and sell, it, and sell a good product. And um, like I said before, uh, I think I, I look at it as patents kind of a deterrent, that they're probably going to think twice before they uh, would infringe. Um, um, and what was the second, uh, uh, the second part? I'm sorry. Oh, if you were, if you were, if they uh, claim, that, if they claim that you're destroying their product, they already, they already have some product need, but you have a better product, and so they're saying, well, hey, we had a product, and this new thing is ruining our thing, so we're, we're going to sue. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of competition there, you know. If you that's that's the goal is to make a better product, and I, I think that would be a pretty baseless lawsuit to, uh, to say that you did. Somebody made a better product, so they're destroying your business. Uh, that ha that happens every day. So, yeah. I think that when you're an inventor um, or an innovator, you you have to have the mentality that you are out there, and you're not the only one. You're competing against hundreds, thousands of people worldwide. Not not just where you are, but um, think. Globally, that's the way uh, I think. I think big, so I can't expect to be the only one. But what I can expect is to be the best one. That's my mentality. So I believe that I'm going to encounter difficulties. Um, my mindset is that I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep swimming. And I'm gonna move forward, and I. My mentality is that one day I'll be the number one, uh, bed, uh, the number one bed sheet. I'll have the number one bed sheet in the bed linen industry. One day, one day my bed sheets and my products. I have other products that will be the ones that they're gonna be leading um, in the industry, leaders in the industry. I don't want to stress out. I don't want to invest my energy thinking someone is going to sue me or someone. You know, I'll take care of that when that time comes, and hopefully never. But let's be realistic. It might happen. But um, just be positive. Just be uh, focused. Just you know, keep moving forward. Uh, I mean, it's like the way I see it. You're in a you know, in a train station that is full of people. And you know you have to catch that train. So, and, and uh, picture me, um, uh, about 105 pounds and 411. And if I wait for everybody to get in the train and I'm like, no, I'm not gonna push people, you know, <laughs> that's the way I think. I have to get, you know? Um, I'm small so I can get between the cracks, <laughs> so. That's the way you, you, you have to see yourself. Don't, don't be afraid. I mean, yes, you're afraid, but don't be. You know, I'm, I mean, the way to succeed is just to be focused and be persistent and be determined. Just, you know, worry about that when the time comes. And in my case, I believe in God 100%. I believe that God is the one that keeps opening all these doors. And I believe that he, if he allows that to happen, it's because I'm going to learn something that is going to make me stronger. That's the way I see it. Okay, this is our final question. Okay. Uh, uh, firstly, thank you for sharing your experience. It's very valuable, valuable information. Uh, I have two questions from Mr. Steele. Number one, when you got your prototype ready, although you yourself is an engineer, do you felt a need to hire a design engineer for mass production to make it suitable for mass production? And the second question is, when you started to get in Amazon, how it was easy to get into Amazon or, or it is a lot of learning? Um, so the, the first part of the question about making it ready for mass production, most of what I do to make the product is actually assembly of other other products that that, that I can that I can buy other places. So, um, for instance, the um, 
this this reservoir that that I use is is rated for 125 psi. You know, for like air pre using like an air compressor. Uh, it in operation on a motorcycle, it uses like half. A, it gets up to maybe half of a psi. So it's way way over over engineered for for what is needed. So. Um, and then mo most of the other components are tubing and things like that, that and it's still very low pressure. Um, as far as Amazon, it's extremely easy to get on Amazon. I mean, as a matter of fact, um, so, I mean, you, you, you said you have to set up a seller account and, and basically you still own the products. Like I'll send, I'll send boxes of my products. I have this product and a few other products on Amazon, but I'll send like boxes of products to them. They keep them in their warehouse and, and people buy them like on Amazon Prime and they ship them to them, but it's, it's very easy. And Amazon actually even has something called Amazon University where you can go and they'll tell you, I mean, they, they have videos showing you how to, how to set up an account, how to, you know, uh, how, to, how to fill out all the, the, the online forms for sending products in and things like that. And so I had signed up, you know, once you're selling in the U.S., they'll, they'll, you'll get things saying um, sell globally, you know, so go to, go to Europe. And I clicked on Europe, and then I figured out, oh, I've gotta, you got to worry about VAT tax when you go to Europe. You, know, you have to collect VAT tax when you sell on Amazon in Europe. And I'm like, eh, I'll, I'll, I may just wait on that. I'll, I'll put it on the back burner. Well, Amazon started emailing me, say, hey, we noticed you haven't st started selling any products in Europe. We'd like to... Um, have a call with you to you know see if we can help you so the lady called me on a, a friday afternoon and she said and she asked me you know I said, what, what was i waiting for i said well I, I don't know how to set up a vat tax and things like that she goes we got, I, we got a company that'll do it for you for free it was a company uh it was actually a shipping company and what they did they helped you set up the vat account for free and then when uh then when it came time for you to ship your products to amazon they hoped you would use their shipping service which i did you know so um, so, but yeah, it's, it's, it's actually very easy to get on Amazon. Okay, thank you. Um, so actually, I, I've been in, in communication with uh, our other panelist, Kyle, um, if you see me on my phone. Uh, he's still, unfortunately, uh, stuck in transit, but he is going to make it here. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to kind of, we're going to end this panel now and then we'll reconvene this uh, <laughs> later. But I want to thank both of you for sharing your wonderful stories. Yeah, I just want to say what an inspiration it was to hear Ruth's story. I mean, oh, to, anybody you. that comes to comes to InventCon and sleep, sleeps in their car, that's determination. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really is. So, yeah. Thank you.